Good morning, and welcome to Moncton and Presswick North Parish Church. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Alan McBain, one of the elders here, uh, a member of the AV team and also the worship team, which is why I'm up here. Uh, we also worship, sorry, welcome anyone who is watching online, whether live or uh, after the fact, and to all members of uh, Prestwick South Church who are joining us here today. If uh, you are sticking around after the service, we have teas and coffees through in the hall, out the front, down the side, follow the noise and the smell of coffee, and into the hall, and you're welcome to join us there. There may be biscuits, you never know. Um, <clears throat> if you've been watching the screen as you've been sitting there, you'll have seen some of the announcements that we have, and here are a few that are picked out. Uh, the World Day of Prayer, which will take place on Friday the 1st of March, will be at 2 p.m. here in MPN. The services will be, service will, has been written by the Ladies of Palestine. Um, we have two funerals coming up, uh, one for a member of MPN, Norma Quinn, um, on the 9th of February at 11 a.m. here, followed by 12 noon at Mason Hill, and you are welcome to join us for that. Uh, and a member of Prestwick South, Betty Miller, on the 6th of February, and that will be at Mason Hill. I don't have a time, Margaret. 3.30, that will be at 3.30 at Mason Hill. Thank you very much. Uh, for joint services in February, we will be here in Moncton and Presswick North, and during March, we will be at South Church. We welcome you here as we praise the Lord and we bring worship to his name. Our first, uh, first hymn this morning is Mission Praise 1040, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. intercession will be given by Jan. Good morning. morning. Okay, let us pray. We 
come this morning to worship in your church, as your people, to listen to your word and rejoice that you are the one, the only, our living God. So today we give thanks for all the amazing things that happen in our lives, the small and the large miracles that you oversee, the way in which we can change our hearts, our emotions and our thoughts by listening for your voice, by reading our Bible, watching other Christians and deciding how to react. It's not always easy, though, to be kind, thoughtful, patient, etc. And we come up with loads of things, excuses as to why we were like that. But you forgive us. Why you forgive us when it's the same old things we keep saying sorry for is beyond our understanding, especially when our expectation of others is often so very high. So we pray that this week we change some of our negatives into positives. We pray with thanksgiving rather than apology, and we pray for the Holy Spirit to move within us. But for the greatest present ever, we give thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, who was born, died, rose, and ascended to glory for us. Such a gift, such a sacrifice. And all God's people say, Amen. The readings this morning will be given by Jim McLaughlin. Morning, everyone. The first uh, reading this morning is from 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verses 18 to 20. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord a boy wearing a linen iPod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife. May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And then from Colossians chapter 3 and verses 12 to 17. Rule, rules for holy living. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if, if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father, through him. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Our next praise is Mission Praise 880, Lord I Come to You.
Jeffrey is now going to come up and give an all-age talk, not just for kids. Good morning. morning. Today, we are going to have a bit of a guessing game. We'll be discussing clothes and what they tell us about the person wearing them. We have lots of pictures for you today. And I bet the AV team just love me. <laughs> so here we go. Well, with the first set, let's guess what these people do to earn a living. What is their job? Yes? They are nurses in hospital helping us. Uh huh. And the next one? No. What does this person do for a living? Where do you think they work? Where do you think they work? McDonald's. McDonald's. I think you're spot on. <laughs> it could be KFC or Burger King. And the next one. Now, what do they do for a living? Anybody? Yep. Shout out so all the old people can hear you. Bin, they are a refuse collector, aren't they? They're a bin man. And boy, do we need bin men. And the next one. Oh, David, what's that man do for a living? What is he? He goes into space. He's an astronaut. And somebody's got to do it, haven't they? Would you like to be an astronaut? No? No? You're quite happy here on Earth. I'm with you. So let's try the next set of pictures. This time you have to guess what the person's hobby is. What do you think they do? Uh huh. Dancers, yes. And what do you think their hobby is? David. Swimming. And you can tell that by their outfits. Now you have to guess which group these children belong to? Yeah, where do they go to? 
The brownies, well done. Uh huh. And what about <laughs> this bunch of boys? <laughs> Where do they go? So, so the they are they're the boys' brigade. Do you go to the boys' brigade? No. All oh, right. Okay. And we can tell the groups they go to by the outfits they wear. Now, this last picture, what does this tell us about the person wearing it? What does that tell us? Yes, what does it tell us? Uh, they are foot, yes, it's football. So they are football supporters. And the colour of their scarf tells us what team they belong to. Black and white for the United. Blue and red. I know nothing about football, by the way. <laughs> we'll just stop there, maybe. <laughs> we'll just stop for a minute. <laughs> so you've all answered very well. But this little game just proves how much you can tell about a person simply from what they wear. Now a slightly harder question. How do you tell if someone is a Christian? They do, but can you tell the Christians from what they wear? No? Well, let's think about it. We're all here this morning in church because we believe in God's Son, Jesus, Jesus Christ. And that means that we are all Christians. We all get together to pray, well done, and to sing praises to him. But can you actually tell, excluding ministers with dog collars, <laughs> if someone is a Christian. Actually have a look around, look at everyone. In fact, if you want, come on up. Come on, children, you can come up and see from here if you like. Come and have a look at this motley crew. Come and have a look. Come on up. Look at them all. These are Christians. But would you be able to tell? I know, I know. <laughs> now, have a good look. Do they have a uniform? No. Do they look or dress the same way? No. no. Some are dressed very smartly in suits and dress jackets. Others are smart casual. And then there's laid back ones like me with their jeans on. <laughs> and everyone has their own favourite colours. And it really doesn't matter what we wear to church. God doesn't mind. He just loves us and he's happy we're here. But the question remains, how can you tell if someone is a Christian? Have a wee think about it as you go back to your seats. Thank you. Well done. So let's recap. We all look and dress differently. So how can people outside church know that we follow Jesus? How do they know that we are God's people, that we support his team? The answer is, we can't. Not just by looking at us. We don't have a uniform or special outfit, so it's up to us to let them know we are Christians by how we act, in what we say and in what we do. For example, by being kind, gentle and patient. And if someone hurts you, you must practice forgiveness. And boy, sometimes that takes practice. And you children are actually better than that, than the adults at that one. We must try to act wisely. Think before speaking, be peace-loving, and be thankful for what we've got. Most of all, we must try to love and help one another. We should show fellowship and encouragement to each other within church, but also help and show kindness to those outside church. By doing all this, we can let people know what it is to be a Christian. By living how God wants us to live, others will know that we are his people, his team, his group doing his work. And if we do that, perhaps others would like to like what they see and they maybe want to come into church and join us. And wouldn't that be super? Thank you. Thank you, Helen. <clears throat> Exhibit A for the prosecution. I think I'm definitely <laughs> one of the motley crew. Our next praise is Mission Praise 49. Be bold, be strong.
As the young church leave, Jim will come up and read the second reading. second reading is from Luke chapter 2 and verses 41 to 52. Jesus speaks with the religious teachers. Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they travelled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. Amen. Thanks be to the Lord for this reading from his word. Thank you, Jim. Our praise before the sermon is Mission Praise 624, Take My Life and Let It Be.
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Okay, let's talk about the elephantus or elephant in the room. If the readings seem familiar, if you get a feeling of deja vu, it's because, because Kenneth preached on these passages just a few weeks ago in South Church, right in the middle of January. But don't panic. I'm not going to repeat the sermon he gave. And now, while Nelly exits stage left, let us begin. It's part of life. Sometimes kids get lost. Seeing something glittery or hearing a familiar song, they wander off. Maybe you got lost when you were a kid. It's a terrible feeling when you realize that you don't know where you are, when the surroundings and the faces around you, they look strange to you. It's like a scary dream. But when it's one of your kids who is lost, or a kid you are responsible for, that scary dream becomes a nightmare. You run around like tr crazy, looking at all the kids of a certain size, but none have the familiar features. Not one of them looks up at you and says, Hi, Dad. Hi, Mom. Hi, Auntie. Hi, Uncle. In my case, it was my brother who went missing one day. We were on holiday in Nairn in the mid-70s, so he was about oh, four or five years old, and as we usually did each sunny or not-so-sunny day, we headed to the beach. No, really, we did get sunny days, and the beach was real sand. Okay, it wasn't all that warm. It was the East Coast after all, even in the middle of July, but it was sunny. Suddenly, Mum realized that John wasn't there on the beach with the rest of us. She looked around frantically then, guider, guide leader, and theater nurse to the core. She organized us all to search the immediate area, grid irons, checking everything, calling out his name, me, age 10 or 11, June, seven or eight, Irene, John's completely non-identical twin, and if you've met her, you know that She's nothing like him. Hi, Irene. <clears throat> and Dad, of course. When we still couldn't find him, she got us all bundled into the car so she wouldn't la lose track of any more of us and made dr Dad drive around. It probably took about 15 minutes, which felt like hours to me and my sisters, but we did find him meandering along the path that ran from above the beach where we'd been playing towards the harbour by way of an amusement arcade. He was wandering around without a care in the world. Then came the parental lecture, interspersed with pointed questions. Where have you been? What were you thinking? What, where were you going? Which, of course, a five-year-old was able to answer coherently without bursting into tears not, followed by wordless hugs and tears of relief. Needless to say, mum was on hyper alert where John was concerned for the rest of the holiday. There's a similar story in Luke's gospel concerning Mary and Joseph and their young son Jesus. This is the only place in the Bible which gives information about Jesus' childhood beyond his birth and flight into Egypt. Luke tells us that the young lad Jesus wandered off from his parents. Seems like a you know, rather ordinary thing, everyday stuff. One commentator put it this way. I have modified his words slow, uh, slightly. You'll see where. We begin Jesus' childhood by the angels ripping open the sky, announcing his birth, and we end it with someone saying his name over the PA system at the ASDA. <clears throat> Other supermarkets are also available. Uh, could the parents of... What did you say your name was, kid? Uh, could the parents of Jesus of Nazareth please come to customer services? In the midst of the excitement surrounding Jesus' birth and his escape to Egypt, 
we have this odd story of Jesus getting lost at the, super, sorry, at the temple. It's as though Luke had collected stories of Jesus in his youth, decided not to use any of them, and somehow this one wasn't pulled out of the folder containing the rest of the stories of his life that were to be published. Given the seemingly unremarkable everyday nature of this story, I've called this sermon the most boring story in the, in the, the Gospels. It could be that it is boring. Of course, once you take a closer look at it and see it in the context of the whole story as told in the Gospels, then it's not quite so boring. The story told through the Gospels, particularly in Luke, is a message about how all people from every class, tribe, and nation have a moment at the manger. Think of the characters involved, starting with Elizabeth and Zechariah, then Mary and Joseph, the Bethlehem innkeeper, and the lowly shepherds, eventually even the, the wise men coming from the east. The point is that Jesus came for everyone. His advent changes things for everyone. Luke's story of Jesus at the temple at age 12 is almost a bit of a palate cleanser from the Christmas story, a story which has become eh, thought of as rather sugary and fantastic, as far as a lot of people are concerned. And then to his life later in miracles. Children wandering off, however, is a story of something that could happen to anyone with worried parents in a panic, scurrying around to find them. Yet it's a unique story in the way that it reveals who Jesus is and what that means for us. Let me, let me offer you three points derived from this story. And there were so many to choose from, and you would kill me if I went into all of them. We'd be here all day. Point number one. Jesus at the threshold. Every year... Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for Passover. And again, when he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival, according to custom. As we're told in Luke 2, 41 to 42. It was March or April, in about AD 8. Given that it was a warm time of year, there would have been fresh flowers and singing birds, all the usual springtime imagery. And by including these details, Jesus is showing that Mary and Joseph were faithful Jews. Even more than that, because men were the only ones required to make the trip at Passover. Luke is showing here Mary's devotion in going with Joseph and taking her son. Traveling to Jerusalem from their home in Nazareth would be like traveling from somewhere small, like the Mellington, other small villages are available, to New York City. Jesus was starstruck by what he found in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the temple! In particular, the temple was the fountainhead of the identity of faithful Jews. Being in Jerusalem for Passover was something to which all Jews aspired. As a 12-year-old, Jesus' instruction in the Jewish faith would have become even more intense. His parents would have explained to Jesus why they went to temple each year and what the great story behind their people was all about. Age 12, the time in that culture of entering adulthood, was a time of learning and increased understanding. A threshold in life recognized pretty much the world over at that point. The body was going through puberty. The mind and emotions start to change drastically. It was while standing on this threshold that Jesus was at the temple when he should, should have been with his parents. Point number two, Jesus gets lost. After the festival ended, Jesus' parents began to trip the trek home, but although they didn't know it, Jesus stayed behind Jerusalem. Yep, you remember this bit. Mistakenly thinking he was somewhere else in the traveling group, Joseph and Mary traveled on for a day. It was a three-day journey back to Nazareth. The, the caravan in which they traveled would be like a, 
a large extended family and a fleet of minibuses driving in convoy these days. It wouldn't be strange for their parents to assume that their son was in another minibus with his cousins. But when they pulled off the motorway to book into their hotel for the night and went to find their teen and take him back to their room, he was nowhere to be found. So they frantically went looking for him among the, among the other relatives and friends in the convoy. Okay, I admit it. Perhaps we've had enough of that particular metaphor. So when Mary and Joseph couldn't find Jesus in the caravan, they hurriedly returned to Jerusalem, where three days after they left, they found him in the temple. Think of it, three days. Three days not knowing what he, where he was. If we were to lose track of our kids for three minutes, most of us would go into a cold sweat these days. We'd be looking in every doorway, back alley, calling the police station, at the hospitals, the shopping centers, fast food places, anywhere we could think of. A mother looking for her lost son is a common yet highly evocative image. In literature, this image is called a trope. A certain action or situation that calls up, sorry, shows up in a lot of so stories. In theology, it's called a type. A certain action or situation that calls attention to other, similar actions or situations. And it's the root of the word typical or typical. Come on, you knew I was going to get some etymology in here somewhere. It always happens. In this passage, there are several. The type of Mary, sorry, the type of three days it took Joseph and Mary to find Jesus in the temple is one. But we're not going to look at that today. Today we're going to look at the trope or type of something or someone who's lost. This is also a trope of parts of human life and in many ways the life of faith. Sometimes it's like you can't find God at all, no matter where you look. You even look in places that, you know, used to be familiar. God seemed to be present when I said this particular prayer and this quiet time and went to this kind of church service. And then suddenly you're thinking, my spiritual life is dry and dead and confusing. You're looking in the doorways of those ideas or back alleys of those old feelings and you can't find God. You're a child looking for your parents. To mix metaphors, your frame doesn't fit the picture anymore. We can all think of study groups or accountability partnerships that seem to work for us as Christians for a certain period of time. And then one day, they didn't seem to work anymore. We might initially panic, thinking God is lost, or worse, hiding. But the truth is much simpler. As we get older, although we're thankful for the early study groups, and that's the simple prayers that seem to connect us to God, we grow in grace, and in knowledge. And we find that godliness is a larger and much more complex picture than we thought it was. Although we may have mastered the habits of regular Bible study, something inside us is now saying, all right, what's next? What now? Okay, we, we've done that part of the, the journey. It's complete. And, and, and I'm going to keep going in, in the path that I've learned. But there must be new places to go, more to see. In those times, you may have experienced God, in the past times, you may have experienced God calling you into serving others, participating in what he was doing there. God may have been calling you into a particular ministry, ministry your part in his kingdom work. It may have been that God was calling you into a marriage and starting a family. And now? Now perhaps God is calling you into new faith relationships. New ways of being. Maybe he's calling you into work that will be more fulfilling. Even though it's more demanding. Perhaps you find yourself 
now in one of those difficult in-between times when God seems lost to you, when you've lost your bearings a bit, but then you seek after him like a mother looking for a lost child and you find him and all is well even if it's changed. As Luke says in Luke 2, 46 to 48, first part, after three days they, they, Mary and Joseph, found Jesus in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. We have to keep in mind one little thing. Between Luke 2, verse 40, and Luke 2, verse 41, a whole decade has passed. Ten years from the visit of the wise men from the east and the blessing given to Jesus by Simeon and Anna. Even though we know nothing about those years, we assume that Jesus lived the life of a hard-working but well-loved Jewish kid growing up in Nazareth a tiny working-class backwater village. Maybe the memory of the miracles surrounding his birth were fading. Maybe Mary occasionally thought, what actually happened? Or Joseph thought, maybe that was just really, really weird dream. It wasn't only the scribes and Pharisees who were amazed at Jesus' answers. His parents were as well. There is Jesus, holding his own in the temple, Equivalent to a pre-teen holding court on the floor of the House of Commons. No, I won't make any comparisons to certain past members of Parliament. This was when boys his age were still in the process of learning, for goodness sake. But he spoke with authority. And everyone stopped to listen. Jesus' parents would have been as shocked as anyone. Perhaps the memories came rushing back. The angels, the shepherds, the magi, the manger, the cold night they thought they might never survive. The rushing escape to Egypt. This is real. This is really happening. I want to share a quote with you from C.S. Lewis, the great Christian thinker and theologian. In his book, Miracles, he writes this. There comes a moment... When the children who've been playing at burglars hush suddenly. Was that a real footstep in the hole? There comes a moment when people who've been dabbling in religion, man's search for God, suddenly draw back. Supposing we really found him. We never meant it to come to that. Worse still, supposing he's found us. That's a wonderful, thought-provoking quote. Here we are, just doing church, and suddenly Jesus shows up. (laughs) Suddenly it becomes clear again that we're dealing with a person. The person. Not a set of ideas, not a cultural structure, not a philosophical comfort blanket. Not a mere concept. These are the moments when we like Mary and Joseph, walk into the temple to find Jesus doing what he's always said he would do. His mother said to him in Luke 2, 48, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. I love Mary's wording. Even 2,000 years ago, in the Aramaic language, stressed out parents use the same phrasing that we use. Your father and I, your father and I worked too hard for you to... Or, your mother and I have been looking for you. Mary gets her reply in Luke 2, 49 to 50. Why were you searching for me? Jesus asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. In some translations, this passage has the writing, I had to be about my father's business. In essence, Jesus is asking his parents, Why were you surprised? You knew this was the deal. You knew I was going to be called to something different, that I wasn't just going to be another kid from our village. Jesus is at the age here, in that culture, in that, and in most cultures throughout history, whereas he he is proclaiming who he is. He's at the age where most of us start to develop an awareness that we're more than just a physical creature that we have other levels of being. 
At that age, when Jewish males are given their bar mitzvah, you start asking questions. You start to wonder. Here, Jesus' personhood is coming out in more dimensions. And for him, his personhood is also his godhood. So we have this, the most boring and everyday of stories in the gospel, becoming one of the most exciting, the moment that serves as a pivot point between Jesus' miraculous birth and his miraculous life. I love that the story of Advent and Christmas funnels down to this. The week following Christmas Day is when many of us put the ornaments away and dispose of that really badly shedding Christmas tree, if you bought a real one. Unless, of course, you waited for Twelfth Night to pack them all away. The kids and or grandkids have been playing with, breaking and getting bored of their new toys. Real life is back on the table. Life that is straight up, sometimes boring, sometimes dramatic, always exhausting. Normal life is back in the house. That brings us to our third and final point. Last one, really. Point three. Jesus in real life. After the shattering drama of the first two chapters, we come to the very real life of a tween on a family holiday. And that's what it comes down to again. We can have great church services, tearful moments, and amazing t- singing. But what does that mean? What does that mean for us on Monday? Or better yet, what does Christmas mean for us in January or February? Maybe we had that time when we were very grateful, very aware, and spending some quality time with family and with what matters most. Do we now go back to life as if nothing has happened? Jesus, the same person we met in these wonderful Christmas songs and those beautiful memories of Christmas gatherings and the intimacy with loved ones, he's still here. Jesus is saying to us that things are different, that we are different. If our Christian life isn't reflected in the way that we treat the postman, then we need to check ourselves. If our great Christian, our great spiritual death isn't shown in the way we relate to other people in daily life, in the good old friction of work and rest, intensity and boredom, then we should be questioning if we really are so spiritually deep after all. Luke ends this section beautifully in Luke 2.51. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. This is said once before, earlier in the chapter, after the shepherds visited the manger. It was right in the middle of the drama and excitement of Jesus' birth with statements made by visitors, both people and angels. Now, in this second instance, it is the midst of a very real real life incident where Jesus gets separated from his parents. Still, Mary treasured all of this in her heart. She treasured both the gifts of God, she treasured the gifts of God, both the dramatic and the mundane. Can we do that? Can we see God and his gifts in our lives beyond Sunday morning? Can we see Jesus in the way we relate to our spouse after a long day? Or our kids, grandkids, nieces and nephews when they drop things all over the floor? And if we can, or if we can't, what are we going to do about it? Amen. Let us pray. Healing God, we give thanks for the ways in which you have brought transformation and new life and the exile of illness, estrangement, broken relationships, bereavement, loss of identity. Speak your words of peace into our hearts. Help us to feel whole. Help us to bring that peace to others so that all may be saved for fullness of life. We give thanks for the growth that can come after difficult times, for renewal of friendship, for the return of self-respect for paths to peace that build respect rather than define winners and losers. 
We pray for the people and places of our world that are on our hearts. We name those for whom we have concerns in our family life, amongst friends, in our own congregation, the wider community and the world. We hold a moment of stillness now to think of them. God of new life, you hold out your hand to draw us from the graves of doubt and despair. May we trust in your power to transform frail flesh to the gold of faith. Give us confidence in the hope of your salvation and resurrection life. And as we raise our prayers to you, we say the prayer that Jesus gave us for all our journeys. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our final praise today is Mission Praise 178. Go forth and tell. be reflected in your eyes, the love of God be reflected in your hands, the wisdom of God be reflected in your words, and the knowledge of God flow from your heart, that all might see and seeing believe. 
And may the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and rest with you always. Amen.